So let's start. Okay. So first of all, thanks for being here, either physically or uh, remotely. So I'm going to talk to you about a novel well balanced global flux approach for hyperbolic systems with source terms. Let's go directly to the outline of the topics that I'm going to introduce. So I will first talk about balance laws, which represent our analytical reference framework. So the systems of PDEs that we would like to solve. And I will underline the importance of the source terms and the main difficulties that arise whenever we have to deal with source terms. Then I will introduce the novel approach. I will talk a bit about our numerical framework. So residual distribution, the fair correction, and continuous FEM for elliptic problems. Then I will introduce the well-balanced modification, which is a modification that we make in order to embed in our scheme some extra properties like the preservation of some exact solutions. And then I will present the numerical results. So let's start by balance laws. This is our reference analytical framework. So we are interested in the solution of uh, these systems of PDEs. It may look a bit abstract, but really questions like this pop up in many applications. Basically, whenever we want to express the conservation of some quantities over a given volume, we end up with an equations like with equations like this. And uh, I told you just to give you some examples. So they can be applied to model earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, traffic flows, biochemical flows, and so on. Really, there are many applications. Just to be a bit patriotic, the picture of the earthquake is a real picture from the earthquake that we had in Messina at the beginning of the previous century. And the drawing representing the volcano, I mean, it's a real drawing representing the Etna. Okay, so as I told you, I'm going to focus now on the source term. So the source terms, uh, which are always present in balanced laws, express non-trivial contributions to the physics that we want to model. So it is important to keep them into account. But whenever we want to deal with source terms, we have also extra complications. So source term can be stiff. So they can introduce limitations on the time step. We can have equilibria that we want to preserve at the discrete level. We will come back on this problem later. The aim of this work was to introduce a novel strategy to deal with source terms, okay? Let's go to the novel strategy. So we start from our uh, uh, initial problem and we couple it with an elliptic problem. If we are able to find such K, we can plug its gradient inside the divergence and go from uh, our initial problem to an equivalent one, which is uh, homogeneous, so which has no source term. It is a global flux approach. Global flux techniques are based on the definition of a global flux, which keeps into account the source term, which is actually what we are doing here. Okay. So in a nutshell, we associate at each time step this elliptic problem to our hyperbolic problem with homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. And uh, we solve it. We plug the gradient of K inside the divergence and we solve the resulting system, uh, homogeneous system, okay? We underline that this approach is pretty general, so it can be coupled with any standard approach, so residual distribution, finite volume, DG, and so on, okay? So now we talk about residual distribution, which is our reference numerical framework for solving the resulting system. So we assume the classical continuous FEM setting, so we assume a test selection of the space domain, so a family on, over, on non overlapping polytopals covering the space domain exactly. The space VH of continuous piecewise polynomial functions with fixed degree, a basis of such, spa of such space, which is such that this basis function can be associated to a degree of freedom, which is located somewhere in the space domain. And we look for UH, which is uh, the approximated solution, which is a linear combination of these basis functions through unknown coefficients, CI, which depend on time. And actually, our purpose is to understand how these coefficients evolve in time. So now we have all the elements that we need in order to introduce the residual distribution, which can be summarized into three steps, okay? We start by defining the element residuals. So the element residuals are nothing but the integral of our initial equation over each element. So we are starting from a physical point of view by a balance at the elements, then we introduce the node residuals such that they fulfill the conservation relation six, 
So basically, from a physical point of view, we are isolating the contribution of the single degree of freedom to the balance of the elements that we have seen in the previous slide. And then we impose the balance at the nodes. So basically, we impose the balance of all the node residuals coming from all the, um, the elements sharing a single degree of freedom. Okay? We end up with seven, which is a, a system of uh, ordinary differential equations that we must solve in time. Up to now, the receipt was quite general because we didn't say actually how to choose the, re the node residuals phi i. Okay? Here is our reference choice. As you can see, we have a Galerkin part plus a stabilization term, which is used in order to avoid the instabilities of central schemes. Okay? If we plug these node residuals into the balance equation that we have seen before, we end up with this system of ordinary differential equations, which is characterized by a mass matrix, which is big and sparse. And so we would like to avoid the inversion of this mass matrix while solving numerically the system of ODEs. Okay? The way for which we get rid of this mass matrix is the deferred correction that I'm going to present now. I will introduce it first in an abstract framework. Imagine that we have two operators, L2 and L1. L2 is a high order implicit operator, the one that we actually would like to solve. L1 is a low order explicit operator. So we would like to solve L1 rather than L2 because it's easier to solve L1 rather than L2. But the point is that the solution to L1 is not accurate enough, okay? So under some assumptions on the operators, we can consider the updating formula 11, which is subjected to the accuracy estimate 12. And as you can see, the formula 11 is uh, fully explicit because UP, which is the unknown of the P iteration, is plugged into the explicit operator L1. And it allows us, thanks to the accuracy estimate 12, to approximate arbitrarily well the solution U delta to the operator L2, okay? Let's now see how to characterize this abstract uh, tool to our uh, particular context. We introduce n plus one sub-time steps in the interval t0, t0 plus delta t. And here we consider the exact solution denoted by ctm and the approximated solution denoted by cm. Just for the initial node, we have the analytical initial condition. So we set the approximation equal to the analytical initial condition. Okay? We can now derive our operators L2 and L1. Okay? We start by deriving L2. We perform, if we perform an exact integration, we uh, get equation 13, which is actually exact. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot perform the exact integration of uh, the terms phi i. Actually, because we don't even add the, the, the we don't even have ct in the interval t0 tm, so we replace phi i with its i order interpolation, i order interpolation with the Lagrange polynomials associated to the nodes that we have introduced in time, and we end up with 14. If we move the finite sum outside and also the, uh, outside of the integral, and also the terms phi i cl outside of the integrals, and we perform the integral of the basis functions, we end up with 15, which is, uh, I mean, our uh, implicit relation, which gives us the approximation in the subtime step M, okay? If we collect the, the contributions of each node, of each degree of freedom, and each subtime step, we get our operator L2. So we would like to find C, such that L2 delta is equal to zero, but this is really a huge nonlinear system, okay? Now we derive the operator L1. So again, we start from the exact uh, uh, integration that we cannot perform. This time we perform an Euler approximation in time, but also a mass lumping, which is used in order to get rid of the mass matrix. We introduce the coefficients CI, which are the integrals of the basis functions over the space domain, okay? And uh, it is important that these coefficients CI are different from zero. It will be more clear in a few seconds why, but we remark that if we choose the Bernstein basis functions, uh, they are strictly greater than zero. So this is a natural choice in this context. It's not the only possible choice, but it's a natural choice. Again, collecting the contributions of each degree of freedom in each sub step, we end up with our explicit operator L1, which is easy to solve actually. If we characterize 
the updating formula we get, I mean, uh, the updating formula 18, which is, as you can see, fully explicit. And as you can, as you can notice, CI is at the denominator. So it is important that it's different from zero. The Bernstein polynomials are a safe choice under this point of view, but it's not the only possible choice, okay? So now continue spam for elliptic problems. So how we actually solve the elliptic problem that we associate to our original problem. And uh, because of the time, I can just give you a sketch. We start from our strong formulation. So looking for who smooth such that it fulfills the equations almost everywhere. And we go to the weak formulation essentially by multiplying by a smooth test function, integrating a space and applying the divergence theorem, okay? And we look for an approximation of the weak solution through the Galerkin method, which is basically projecting the weak formulation over a finite dimensional subspace, okay? And thanks to linearity, the last equation is basically a linear system, okay? So I, I'm, of course, omitting a lot of details, as I told you. I would just like to say that there is a beautiful underlying framework which involves an abstract variational problem and provides really some powerful results like the Lux Milgram lemma or the Sias lemma, which uh, ensures the convergence of the approximated solution to the weak solutions that we were looking for. Now, the well balance modification, okay? So sometimes we are interested in the exact preservation of some analytical solutions. Uh, this point may look a bit controversial. In general, we rely on numerics because we don't have the solutions to the systems of PDEs that we would like to solve. The point is that sometimes we happen to have these solutions and we want to preserve them at the discrete level. For example, a solution that we usually want to preserve um, while dealing with the shallow water equations is the lake at rest solution, okay? Which is uh, basically constant still water level and zero velocity, okay? So this is the solution. The way we achieve this preservation in this context is uh, to recast the problem in terms of the deviation, ut uh, the deviation from the exact solution u tilde that we want to preserve, okay? So we have our initial problem, we have equation 19, which holds because u tilde is a solution, is the solution that we want to preserve, so it satisfies the equation. So we can subtract equation 19 to our initial problem, and introducing delta u, we end up with formula 20. It's straightforward to see that if we use the same space discretization for the second and the third line, we end up with a well-balanced formulation. So also another observation, which is worth to make, if we want to preserve a steady solution, we can directly update u rather than updating delta u, okay? And also this modification is pretty general, so it can be done to any standard framework, so residual distribution, finite volume, dg, and so on. Now I will present the numerical results. So we will focus on two systems of equations, the shallow water equations which are used to model water flows like tsunamis, flows in rivers, in lakes, in channels, and so on, and the Euler equations with gravity, which are used uh, in order to model astrophysical flows, or I mean interstellar flows. So first we tested our method without well-balanced modification in order to understand if the order of accuracy was the one that we expected. Uh, so let's start with the 1D tests. For the shallow water equations, we chose we chose a lake at rest steady state, and for the Euler equations with gravity, we chose uh, another smooth steady state. We got the right order of convergence for all these basis functions, and I would like to underline that we had uh, a super convergence in the monodimensional case for P2 and B2, okay? So better than we expected. Uh, in 2D, so we chose another lake at rest steady state for the shallow water equations, and for the Euler equations with gravity, we chose uh, another smooth steady state, and we got the right order of convergence, but unfortunately only for P1. I mean, when we increase the order of the polynomials, some, I have to say, interesting instabilities arise. The phenomenon is currently under investigation, but I have to be honest, we could not go arbitrary order in 2D. 
Okay? So then we introduced the well balance modification in order to see if it was able to capture the steady state up to machine precision. As you see from the results here, uh, it, the well balance modification is able to capture the steady states up to machine precision. So these are the results with the well balance modification on the same tests that we have seen before. And uh, then we tested our method on some unsteady problems in order to assess if it was able to deal with no steady states. So for example, the Solshock tube for the monodimensional lower equations with gravity. We got these results, which are, I mean, uh, what we expected according to literature, okay? Then we tested our method with and without well-balanced modification on the evolution of a perturbation of a lake at rest steady state, of course, for the shallow water equations. This test was, uh, I mean, in order to assess if the well-balanced modification is not only able to capture the steady state up to machine precision, but also to capture in a more detailed way the evolution of the perturbation of the steady state, okay? So here you can see the initial condition on the left. On the right, the reference numerical solution got through a high order scheme on a very refined mesh. And here on a very coarse mesh, we have the results of the non-well-balanced version on the left, on the right of the well-balanced version. As you can see, even on coarse meshes, the well-balanced modification is able to capture the evolution of the perturbation in a more detailed way, okay? Now the conclusions. So we introduced this new arbitrary high order global flux approach. We tested it without well-balanced modification in order to assess if the order of convergence was the one that we expected. We got the right order of convergence apart from some super convergence in P2 and B2 in 1D and some instabilities which, by the way, look very interesting. This I would like to point out <laughs> in the 2D case for high order polynomials, okay? Then we introduced the well-balanced modification and we saw that it was able to preserve the steady state up to machine precision and to capture in a more detailed way the evolution of a perturbation, okay? So this was all. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed and if you have questions, I'm here. Thank you, Lorenzo, for the nice presentation and for staying in time. Now, uh, I, I think it's time for uh, discussion, which is going to be led by Professor Boscheri from the University of Ferrara. Please, Walter. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo, for your talk, which was, um, I think, very well prepared and precise. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I only have a couple of questions. So the yeah. first one, is uh, uh, related to the stability of the numerical method you propose. Uh, and in particular, I would like to know um, on which basis the um, CFL number was chosen for the test cases you proposed. Well, uh, because I saw that it's 0.1, but it's a, a 1D um, mesh, if I'm not wrong. So I would like to understand how you, you set the CFL number in your simulations and why. Yeah, actually we didn't make a stability study. So actually it was uh, 0 .0 0 0.1 because uh, I mean, it was small enough to get convergence, but we didn't investigate actually how to modify the CFL, okay? It's something that we plan to do, but uh, we, didn't do, we didn't do it uh, now. I mean, uh, so, but it's, uh, I mean, something that really we want to study further because First, we wanted to study if there was convergence, and then, I mean, we will study stability. Okay, but say 0.9, you, you, you didn't try, for instance. No, I didn't try. I mean, uh, by experience, I know that uh, with residual distribution, we coupled with DAC, you cannot increase uh, 